So Father's Day is kind of the sketchy holiday, right? I mean, the commercials come on and they say, it's the third week in June, everybody head to the mall. But you know, it's not everybody because there's households with single moms or with two moms or parents who don't identify as fathers. Even fathers like me listen to these commercials. I'm like, who are you talking to? You know, because I don't smoke a pipe. I think golf is boring and after shave makes me sneeze. Mother's Day, they're a lot more straightforward about it, about what they're trying to tell us. And you know, Mother's Day, they tell us, is all about guilt. It's about trying to repay the gift you can never repay. Please, mom, take these flowers. What will it take? But Father's Day, you know, it took me a little bit before I could figure out what are they what are they telling us here what's the meaning underneath this and I've started to wonder listening to these commercials is Father's Day an attempt to appease an angry God is Father's Day an attempt to curry favor with some distant unpredictable figure of terror you know and it goes along with some of the messages that we hear about fathers as the ones who stand at the top of the stairs and say don't make me come down there or who are driving down the highway say don't make me pull over this car and people will chuckle about it or they get nostalgic about it as if well what are you going to do Fathers are violent. Fathers threaten their children. That's just the way of things. And, you know, I really wonder where we got this idea, uh, this sort of assumption that that's that a dutiful father scares the hell out of his kids made me look back at the Bible, at the Hebrew Scriptures, chapter 22 in Genesis, with the binding of Isaac. Now, the binding of Isaac is a story a lot of people like to flip past. It's a hard one to handle. So I'm going to start before that. Early on in Genesis, Abraham and Sarah, who are very old, are told by God, you're going to have a kid. And Sarah famously laughs at this. She says, yeah, right. But they do. They have a kid. They have Isaac. And they love him so much. Oh, they take such joy. They name him Isaac of laughter. And so they, they just love this guy, right? Years pass. Later in the story, Abraham understands that God wants him to go up to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice Isaac. Now, Abraham is one who's used deception and trickery. He's argued with God. He's haggled with God. But God says, go and sacrifice your only son. And Abraham effectively says, oh, okay. So uh, so they walk together, Abraham and Isaac, up to the top of Mount Moriah. And it's only after days of walking together at the top of Mount Moriah, Isaac says, Where's the lamb that we're supposed to slaughter? Which I have to say is a little bit slow on Isaac's part. Abraham binds him up and is about to slay him, about to do violence to his beloved child, when an angel of the Lord comes out and says, Stop. Don't do it. Cease. Now, the message that people will take most often from this is that this was a test and Abraham passed. And he passed because he was willing to do violence to his son. And the message is that a dutiful father, a good father, will be more obedient to a sense of order and righteousness than to the call of his own tender heart for his own beloved child. And this sense of what a father's about carries through down the ages to the father who raises his hand and says, don't make me come down there. Don't make me override the call of my tenderness and come down there to enforce order is what that father's saying. And it's so common, you know, we hear it all the time. I was having supper last year with a friend of mine who is a pastor and a father, and he was telling me his notion of father. He was saying that kids are born sinful and greedy and needy, and that as a father, it's his duty to train that out of them, to correct them. And I'm sitting there eating my noodles thinking, that is not at all what I think. That's not how I father, dude. But, uh, you know, it's pretty common. Even in the story of the crucifixion, we understand this, and we're told that it's the story of a father who did violence to his child for the sake of the greater good. And before we start wagging our fingers or clucking our tongues about how I would never, I wouldn't do that, you know, there may be extreme cases. I think about a story that a World War II veteran told me. He was 18 years old, about to be deployed to Germany, and his parents are saying goodbye to him. It was the only time he ever saw his father cry. His father was crying to let his son go go, but it was worth it in that household for the sake of defeating Hitler. That was the larger cause for which the parents were willing to let their child go. So that's an extreme case, but as a walking around philosophy, I think it's pretty messed up, pretty problematic, this link between dutiful fatherhood and violence to your children. You know, there are different ways to look at that story. The one that I've described is only one way to take it. Another way to look at the story is God says to Abraham, go sacrifice your son and Abraham and Isaac go up to Mount Moriah. But it's not the first thing that God says or the first uh, way that Abraham replies that is the message of the story that carries the meaning. Instead, it's the second and final word of God in that story. When the angel of the Lord comes out and says, stop. At the moment of violence, when the angel of God, when the whisper of love says, cease, you know, there are some who say this is not a story that says that the dutiful father is the one who is obedient even to the point of violence uh, to his own children.
There are those who say this story illustrates the cessation of violence, the end of the time when we would harm our young, when we would harm the future generations. This is the message, that fatherhood is about the capacity for violence that is within all of us in this world and the decision in obedience to the whisper of love to stay our hand, to cease violence, to stop, and to uphold that dream of the generations to come, to be tender at last, merciful at last, compassionate at last. In our household, we use this line, we say, may I use my strength to help and not to hurt. And on this Father's Day, I want to ask that we reconsider the notions of fatherhood and Father's Day that are told to us and that we might use instead this Father's Day as a day to understand our capacity for doing good and evil in this world and that Father's Day and fatherhood is a day and a role in which we are called to be gentle again, to be tender again, to stay our hand, and to walk in the light of love. So may it be.